Thank you, uh, Kishtov. Now to the uh, third speaker, <coughs> Professor uh, Shaul Fridlander from the University of California at uh, Los Angeles. I'm not uh, going to enumerate uh, Fridlander's uh, long list of scholarly achievements, which made him uh, a world renowned authority on the history of modern Germany and the Holocaust and brought him many important prizes. I will only mention the works that are uh, relevant to the theme uh, of this round table. His uh, poignant memoir, memoir of 1979, When Memory Comes, in which he moves back and forth between his childhood years in Europe under the shadow of the Holocaust and his uh, adulthood in Israel, 1977, when the peace process with Egypt is advancing. In 1992, uh, he published an edited volume probing the limits of presentation, Nazism and the Final uh, Solution. And in the following year came out the already mentioned memory, history, and the extermination of the Jews of Europe. In addition, as was already mentioned, he is the uh, founder and the first editor of the volume uh, of the journal History and Memory, edited at the School of Historical Studies here at Tel Aviv University, which is the first uh, scholarly journal that was dedicated to that uh, Topic. Please, so. Thank you very much, Adner. Uh, thanks uh, to Pierre and to Christoph Tchevsky for their wonderful presentations. Um, I will be much shorter because I'm part of this place, actually, very much so, and happy to be back here, uh, not in such a beautiful hall, but Gilman, uh, well, you know. Uh, but still, uh, uh, I will allow myself to just uh, uh, raise some questions and maybe that way already start uh, the debate. We heard two very different lectures, which I hadn't seen before, but uh, which I think I could grasp. Uh, the memory, uh, the, the, the work of art, I would say, of the uh, building of a national, slow building over centuries, of a national entity, very much united also, uh, Pierre mentioned the division between those who accepted the revolution and those who rejected it, and this went as far as Vichy and even the afterwar. All in all, we have a work of art that is France. And that is really what you addressed there in your lecture, and you wondered about the part of memory. Uh, in, uh, in, uh, nowadays, from the 80s, you said, uh, looking backwards, what is the part of memory in the French experience? Nowadays and, nowadays, and you found those places of memory where really uh, the attention concentrates according to, of course, your uh, argument. On the other hand, uh, Christoph Tchitschewski presented us, and I think I don't misunderstand, uh, misunderstand, I didn't misunderstand you, with fragments which you try to pull together through uh, the various initiatives, wonderful initiatives, which you mentioned, in order to create a common ground. Did I understand you correctly? And to create, and that is of course the paradox of your lecture, a common memory, right. which is impossible, if I may say, I will start with you. Because you have the Ukrainian memory, you have the Belarusian memory, you have the Lithuanian memory, you have the Polish memory, and you have the phantomatic Jewish memory of those places. How, 
your project, which is wonderful, of building bridges between these various ethnic, religious, and national groups in order to create that, that agora where you will all discuss, but for the time being, this is a, is a virtual agora, mm -hmm. uh, like what, uh, let's say, Marvin Minsky could teach us, right? It's a place <laughs> where there is a lot of debate potentially somewhere. Uh, this is the basic question which at least I would very much like to hear from you. That is, what is being achieved? Mm -hmm. What is being dream, dreamt of is wonderful. Mm -hmm. What are the results? And maybe they could even be applied here, is of course the question. Mm -hmm. Now, I will speak at some more length about Pierre's uh, lecture because, of course, I'm much more familiar with, uh, with the material. You see, Pierre, uh, and you allow me to call you Pierre, right? Not Professor Norman. <laughs> uh, we yeah, go, we go back to 66. Yeah, 66. So, <laughs> 66. Um, the question which you did not maybe answer is why the 80s? You see, you said that from the 80s on, and that's when you started your immense work, and I, if I may say very modestly, I wrote the first review, I think, in the Figaro. Yes. Yes. And thank you again. <laughs> in 84, if I'm not mistaken, and I was a little bit skeptical about the uh, lieu de mémoire because, because I didn't know how you chose your lieu de mémoire. I was wondering whether Le Zouave de l'Alma, I mentioned that, that is the soldier, the statue of the Zouave, which is a type of French soldier, on the Pont de l'Alma in Paris couldn't be a lieu de mémoire, or uh, uh, actually one could choose hundreds of lieu de mémoire, and the question is one uh, of selection, which uh, br brings us back to the various memories, that is, the lieu de mémoires for this group, and there are lieu de memoirs for that group, and of course, you will say that France, because this unity uh, has ultimately, la nation has the same lieu de memoirs, but uh, this is a question to be answered. But the big question is why the 80s? And you spoke of post-colonialism uh, and of wider movements uh, in the world, um, I would say that some minor, minor elements in France and elsewhere started that memory, uh, that devotion to memory sometime in the 80s. And I may be completely wrong, but uh, you have to prove me wrong on that. You had amnesia about the immediate past, which after all was the most heavy part of memory in France, in Germany, not to speak of the Soviet Union, and actually all over. And I speak, of course, about the memory of the Shoah, of the Holocaust, which was not really mentioned, and you remember better than anybody else that le chagrin et la pitié, the sorrow and the pity, when it was produced in the late 70s, just after the goal, uh, in the late uh, 60s, just after the goal left power, uh, was forbidden in, on television. It was shown in one small cinema in Paris and came uh, to television only under Mitterrand. That is indeed in the 80s. But then, why the 80s? And I would suggest here uh, something which will bring in the media into our discussion, because memory, uh, history, memory, and again, history, memory are abstract entities. But nowadays, most students, of course, in California, but I would say uh, here as well, most young people have no notion either of history or of memory, they know some films, 
which teach them artificial and artificial memory, which is extremely difficult to eradicate. Now, what happened in the late 70s? And that, I think, would explain the 80s uh, as well, let us say, as the ground uh, movements which you mentioned, uh, I agree with. But then again, post-colonialism should have started in the 60s. It waited until the 80s. Well, there was a totally horrible film by, uh, produced by CBS called Holocaust, which most of you may have seen way back, which today nobody would be able to see, which uh, CBS produced for purely commercial reasons after the success of Roots, uh, which was about slavery. CBS decided to try another group of victims, and the uh, and, uh, film which uh, conquered the United States within a few weeks, moved to Europe, and when it was shown on a back channel in Germany, because the Germans were not sure that this would really be pleasing to the German public, when it was shown on Channel 3, I think, in, in Germany, millions of Germans assaulted, I would say, the phone exchanges of the television state station and it broke down because of the number of people calling and saying we really never heard of that. Uh, uh, why we, were we never taught or told about the extermination of the Jews and uh, of course all related events? Now of course they knew about it. They knew perfectly about it except that they repressed it. And uh, or forgot it, uh, and that is the big question because in France, Pierre, you had the same phenomenon, uh, as I mentioned regarding uh, le chagrin et la pitié, and many other things. That is, for some reason, maybe CBS was the the, the declencher, the trigger, which brought all over Europe a kind of of breaking down of amnesia which also happened, of course, in the East, with the downfall of the Soviet Union. It was slightly uh, later, but by a few years. And suddenly, in a country like Germany, where you had deep amnesia, also you had uh, strange movements, and a few books of history that nobody read, or very few people read, notwithstanding the trials, the Auschwitz trials, not, uh, of course, before that, the Eichmann trial in Jerusalem, notwithstanding that, that created some interest within a few, for a few moments, and then the amnesia fell back again. Of course, you had the Hitler Welle and so on, that is kind of admiration for Hitler, Zieberberg and so on, but you didn't have any confrontation with the past in its full horror. Here comes CBS, an American production of no value, and suddenly everybody says, well, why didn't I know that? Nowadays, we know from history that between 30 and 40 million Germans were aware of the extermination during the war, uh, not a small number. And of course, the children uh, heard about the parents, the student movement uh, created some tensions within the families, resolved after a few years, and the grandchildren are those, and I think there we touch on the, on the change, the change of generations. That is, it demanded in Europe, I would say 40 years or 37, 38 years after the war, for Europeans in France, in Germany, I would say even here for, uh, for many, to really confront one of the most uh, cataclysmic and, and of course uh, catastrophic uh, past experiences. Now this was not the first time mm -hmm. this happened. It happened with World War I. And with World War I, you had an upsurge of memory in France, for example, which you, of course, wrote about in, in, in your 
uh, vol uh, in volume one, I think, Antoine Pro, yes. on the, uh, on the uh, ancien combatant, and also somebody else wrote about the funeral monuments in, in France or in Germany or all over Europe. If you go to a small village, to the smallest village, you will have a monument or more that is a monument where the names of those who fell uh, during that horrible and incomprehensible war uh, are written down, and then you have one or two names of those names of those who fell in World War II in France, of course. Uh, and every year, on the 11th of November, the memoir indeed, yes. you had various delegations going and really, uh, I would say, speaking with all their heart and soul in front of the monument, you had the nationalists, and you had the pacifists, and you had other groups, but you had living memories because of uh, the, the immediate impact of that uh, senseless killing of millions on all sides. Now, what was the function of memory here? It was, to, of course, to explain the past. I mean, uh, if you were a nationalist, you would say, we reconquer in France, right? We reconquered Alsace-Lorraine, etc. Now we are there, but no war anymore. C'était la guerre de guerre, something like that. If you were a pacifist, you would stress that point in much, uh, with much greater strength. Of course, in Germany, things were very different in front of the same type of monuments. And uh, I think you published in your volumes uh, the iconography of those monuments. And yes. if you didn't do, Reinhard Koselleck yes. did it. And, uh, these are very known uh, works on what the monuments mean. So even after World War I, you had this upsurge of memory, mm -hmm. and then its downfall, because of course World War II came, and things took different proportions. But what then happened was, uh, was uh, stricken off the calendar. That is, yes, during the Nuremberg trials, you had a lot of publicity, and people remember the photos taken of Bergen Belsen and so on with the mounds of, uh, of corpses. But basically, uh, from the 50s on, nobody spoke. Not in Germany, not in France, Pierre. And when the great movie came out, um, uh, Nuit et Brouillard, Night and Fog, uh, the word Jew was never mentioned, as you know. They, they were communists who wrote the, uh, the I, uh, it's Carol uh, and uh, the, the metteur en scène. René. René. Carol and René were communists, and therefore they spoke of, of genocide. And even that was seen by very few uh, people, but it, it's one of those words who remain. Uh, which remain, and uh, the, the novels which came out, some had a kind of sentimental impact for a few months, uh, Le Dernier de Juste, Schwarzbach, but all in all it was silence. In Germany it was complete silence, I exaggerate of course, but here and there you had voices and slowly some work was done, but nobody read it. And when Raoul Hilberg brought out his book about the destruction of the European Jews. Yes. It was published with great difficulty in the United States after many publishers refused to publish it and ultimately translated into German, a very bad translation, in 1983, that is, it was published in 61, and ultimately translated in 83, then retranslated, of course. So it shows you in a few examples, it shows you uh, what was happening, and I, I don't need to mention, Christoph, uh, that the silence of, uh, let's say, Yedvabne and so on in the Kreshi, right, uh, was a, a heavy silence. So that we can extend that silence to Eastern Europe, and it took Yevtuchenko to mention Babiyar, but it really... 
So we have a, a, a kind of massive event, uh, somehow uh, with a shadow which covers the whole of Europe and, and beyond. And we have a few attempts to, to say something, but ultimately it is pushed away. And again, the, uh, the example of Hilberg uh, is a very strong example. Now, why the 80s? I, I have thought of that for, for a long time. And I think really, and you will contradict me, on, that it is the, it is the, this kitschy but appealing to the immense number uh, production of uh, an American uh, television company which suddenly broke uh, the ice. But again, I think this is the trigger and the deep force. You mentioned post-colonialism all that. It wouldn't apply here, but it of course applies. The deep force was the change of generations. And I think that uh, your study on generations is essential for this. Because after World War II, you had this amnesia period and then uh, the outburst. Now I want to say something about the type of memory that is coming back. I mentioned the artificial production of, a, of an artificial memory. That is not what you remember from your family, from your grandparents, and from your grandparents, one often doesn't remember much. There is a book which was published in Germany a few years ago entitled Opa war kein Nazi. My grandfather was not a Nazi. That is, each family says, oh yes, the Nazis, but my grandfather never. So, and that's a very famous book in, a, a famous book in Germany. But what is remarkable is that this memory, which started boiling over in the 80s, is difficult to control, very difficult to control. You can create it, you can work on it, but it is, it is in a way automatic. And I will give you two examples. 83, 50 years to Hitler's uh, accession to power, there are already a few movements saying, we, the Germans, our memory has been stolen mm. by the Allies, by the others, by the Jews, but mm. not to be said. So it's the American East Coast journalists, which is a code name for Jews. And then comes 19, 1985, and there all hell breaks loose, because 85 was 40 years after the end of the war. Now you come to the symbols, 40 years in the desert. We were 40 years in the desert, but now has come the time for Schlussstrich, for the end, the final line, for putting an end to the story. And I remember I was in Paris at that time, uh, waiting to go to, to, to Berlin, to the Wissenschaftskolleg, and I read in this site an article by Goloman, the son, the eldest son of Thomas Mann, who writes, who, after 40 years, would have had the idea to commemorate Waterloo? I mean, after all the terrible things Napoleon did, who among the French would, after uh, this period, mention the crimes of Napoleon? Enough is enough. The comparison itself was pretty strange, but uh, in any case, that is what Goloman uh, who should have known better, of course, wrote. And then came, I mean, symbolic, uh, you didn't, I think, sufficiently mention triggering symbols. 85, the call is in power in Germany, in France, Mitterrand tries to reach out to him because, you see, Kohl was not invited to the celebration of the debarquement in Normandy in uh, 84 for good reasons. I mean, the Germans were on the other side. But uh, the Germans took it badly. And uh, Mitterrand thought that they would uh, shake hands in Verda. All right, that's very symbolic. But it didn't have a great echo. So now, 85, President Reagan, uh, who is the American president, decides to visit Kohl in a military cemetery where there would be tombs 
of German soldiers and tombs of American soldiers. That is, it's the, it's the coming together, the bridging. It didn't work well, I can tell you. Because, because, it, 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 yeah, well, I'm, coming, I'm coming to it. Because there was snow on the ground when, uh, when they chose the place of Bitburg. When the snow melted, you discovered there were American dead and there were young SS dead, which probably killed the Americans in the Battle of the Bulge. So, enormous scandal. Our friend Eli Wiesel spoke in Congress, addressed President Reagan, told him, don't go there, and so on. Reagan went, but he didn't go into the cemetery. They met in Bergen-Belsen, and then they went outside, I think, the cemetery. In any case, he didn't enter that uh, uh, terrible Bitburg cemetery. But that, of course, launched a counterattack among those Germans who felt that their past had been stolen from them, and now came the battle, not of words only, historians' controversy, but of films. I mean, I don't want to go into the details, but film plays an enormous role. Edgar Reitz, the German director, produced the first element of Heimat, which was, as he said it in interviews, this is the answer to CBS. They have stolen our memory. Now I will show you the memory of, Ger of the ordinary German as it was. It shows a small village, which is his village. And indeed, uh, during the Third Reich, everything was practically peaceful. They didn't know anything, and they lived their ordinary daily life. Uh, Alltagsgeschichte in German, the ordinary everyday life. What was the catastrophe then? When the Americans arrived, they brought modernization and they destroyed the traditions on which the village memory was. So the catastrophe moved from the Third Reich to the Americans. And I could go on with that. Of course, Claude Lanzmann, not knowing about uh, Heimat, answered in a way with his film, and since then you have a kind of battle of memories. So memory is a very moving ground, yes. and I would say very moving, and not the kind of hieratic construction right. which it is in France or wars, and which you studied so wonderfully at Vienna. Uh, I think today it goes, as you said, Le Bret Les Bretons and Les Corses and everybody else wants his own, it, it, his own, its own memory. And uh, to recreate that France, that unified France, becomes almost an impossibility, I would say. So I don't want to go on because we really have, uh, won't even have time for lunch. Uh, but uh, let me say that... Uh, the, between the private and the public uh, is a different uh, issue and I, want, I do not want to touch it, I just want to say that among, for the private person, uh, like Christophe, but of course he's another generation, but like Pierre, the, the individual part uh, and participation and experience cannot but influence our way of working on history and memory. Uh, there is no way of escaping one's past. And I was told, uh, as some of you may know, by a very famous German historian, Martin Brochard, in an exchange of letters, he wrote to me, uh, hitting, uh, aiming at me, but uh, in general at the Jews, that, uh, of course, the memory of the victims has to be respected deeply, but it is a mythological memory, and therefore it is an obstacle to rational German historiography, memory and history. So I answered, because we exchanged it, dear Mr. Brochard, don't you think that somebody of your generation who was in the Hitler Youth and actually I didn't write it because I didn't know it, a member of the party doesn't have also a load of subjectivity when he writes the history of the Third Reich. Of course, this, this raised the tone, but uh, basically it showed that nobody can escape uh, his or her own past. 
and that we are all somehow driven by the past into a future which we cannot dig, uh, really figure out, but which is like Clay's uh, angel. Uh, we are looking backwards on the ruins, and the wind pushes us in the future. Thank you very much.